what I want to do this morning is to put the Overland Telegraph into some form of context. And essentially, it's a story about communication. And for a British colony here, literally on the other side of the world, communication is an exceptionally important part of the operation and the establishment uh, of our community and society. There's several forms of it, uh, starting with the official communications. These are the business of operating the colony, uh, the instructions from the colonisation commissioners, the instructions from the South Australian company, and of course the reports that had to be sent back to England. Uh, then there's the business of business, uh, the import and sale of goods, and then as the colony's resources were uh, exploited, uh, sending those goods back and finding markets. The very important aspect of personal communication, letters back home, and they played a critical part in encouraging friends and family to also make this quite extraordinary journey of months and months to come to the other side of the world and start in a new land. And I've added a fourth category, that of topical communication. People here were still part of Europe, they, we still are, Europeans. And they were hungry for news from back home. And that meant that the newspapers were very keen to get rapid communication. And in fact, they became the power users of the telegraph. And of course, the only form in which that communication could take place is by putting words on a piece of paper. And that piece of paper then has to be transported by ship. Uh, it was pretty ad hoc at first. Uh, perhaps you might find a ship's captain willing to carry letters for you. But in 1809, the colony of New South Wales established the first post office, and we followed suit in June of uh, 1837. Thomas Gilbert was appointed the first postmaster. And of course, all of that um, mail had to come from the other side of the world by ship. And once they got around uh, the tip of South Africa, the Roaring Forties would provide a bit of a tailwind to get ships here to what was then called King George's Sound, today's Albany, and from here the mail was transferred to faster vessels to get it to Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney and the other capitals. Uh, the Victorians, of course, thought uh, it would be much uh, more appropriate if the mail came to Melbourne first, then it could be distributed to the other points. And that took typically about three months, and of course to go back in the other direction without the advantage of the Roaring Forties could be longer. Uh, this is the city of Adelaide, and its best time was 72 days. So there was a great deal of anxiety about getting hold of the mail when it finally got here. This is Holdfast Bay, uh, the sketch by Colonel Light, and prominent in this uh, sketch is the flagstaff, and as soon as they saw something coming up the gulf, a signal would be flown up that flagstaff, and people would start to rush down to Glenelg to uh, receive the mail. The only problem is that when the southwesterlies blow, South uh, Glenelg is not a very sheltered harbour. It might have been a secure anchorage, but it wasn't a sheltered harbour. So they decided they'd look elsewhere. Going all the way up here to the port, they'd have to get through this sandbar uh, at the mouth of the river. But they looked at a point here, just um, immediately west of Port Adelaide. Uh, another flag staff was established there, and then a contractor would have to go out to the ship, bring the mail on shore, put it on a cart, get it across the sand hills to the Port River, put it on the boat, take it across the Port River, put it on another cart, uh, and finally it made its way to uh, what Brian Samuels tells me was uh, the post office in North Parade. Uh, here is the post office. I think uh, this building still stands, but the post office itself was demolished a while ago. And in front of it is a horse and cart. Now, possibly that is the mail contractor whose job it is to take the mail from Port Adelaide to Adelaide. And this is the tender for that service. It's dated the 1st of April, 1848. And I draw your attention to this particular clause. Contractors will be fined 10 shillings for every 10 minutes late they are in their time of arrival. Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that the mail has taken three months to get here. They are now stressing about the last 10 minutes 
and 10 shillings, I think, is about $400 uh, in today's cash. And of course, we're not the only British colony on this side of the world. Uh, to the north of us are some very significant colonies in uh, India and uh, the far east, and serious money is being made here. We've got the British East India Company, which later became the Raj. We've got the Strait Settlements, and uh, just around here, tucked on the side of China, the Crown Colony of Hong Kong. And we've got major resources, spices, rubber, tin, and let's not forget the disgraceful trade in opium. Now, for their mail to get there, the same thing had to happen. It arrived by ship, but without the advantage of the roaring 40s, it took a little bit longer. And these were the shipping routes that took mail to those British colonies. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a technology revolution. Here is a, a, a packet steamer. And as well as the uh, traditional sail, you'll notice that it has steam engines. So no longer are those ships so dependent upon the winds. And we now have a much more reliable service. And in fact, here, uh, across uh, Egypt, an enterprising naval lieutenant called Thomas Waghorn organised an overland transport. And ships could now travel through the relatively sheltered Mediterranean. Mail will be carried across to the Red Sea, and it could then be delivered on a lot more quickly. And just cutting out that trip halved the time that it took, typically now to 45 and possibly even 35 days. And not long after, there was a meet weekly mail service down to Australia, King George Sound again, from uh, what I've now learnt, thanks to the Australian cricket team, is a town called Gaul. So while that uh, is happening, uh, we're also aware that here we've got the Dutch East Indies and fortunately Britain and uh, Holland were on good terms and some enterprising people in uh, the main island of uh, Java, which is here, were starting to talk to the Queensland government about providing a separate mail service. And Queensland were enthusiastic about this because it meant they would become the first people to get the incoming mail and not the last. Uh, but then there was another technology disruption and this was radical and it's very hard for us today I think to appreciate just what changed this report. The electric telegraph. If you had a piece of wire long enough, a switch at one end would produce a signal at the other end instantaneously. And uh, the, the potential for this was easily recognised by the South Australian government. So instead of having that fellow with the horse and cart come all the way here from Port Adelaide along the Port Road, what they were talking about is having a telegraph. So you could open the mail down at Port Adelaide and telegraph the contents up here to the telegraph office, which was then at the railway station. They allocated funds for it in 1853. Now they just needed somebody to operate it. And that person was Charles Todd, uh, pictured here with Alice uh, shortly after their wedding. And they arrived in Adelaide on the 5th of November, 1855. By the following February, Todd had a telegraph operational from Adelaide to Port Adelaide. A couple of months later, the uh, government decided that they would start to talk to their compatriots across in Victoria. And Todd was dispatched across to Melbourne to talk to his counterpart, the Canadian engineer Samuel McGowan. McGowan had worked with uh, Morse in America and he'd constructed the first telegraph in Victoria from Melbourne to the port at Williamstown. By the time Todd went to talk to him, McGowan had extended the Victorian Telegraph to Portland, and the idea here is that the ships coming from the west could call at Portland and the urgent information could be telegraphed through to Melbourne. McGowan had a relatively simple job. He would extend that line to the border, wherever the border might be, but that's another, another story. And Todd's task was then to work out how to take that telegraph line up to Adelaide. Uh, and I find this an extraordinary part of Todd's story. He did this on horseback. 
And I've often wondered where he learned to ride, and the answer was he learned to ride on the beach of Portland when the trooper with him handed him a whip of spurs and the reins of an old horse called Coppet. Apparently the horse didn't like it much. But it was successful. And the Intercolonial Telegraph opened for business on the 21st of June, 1858. Uh, this is the Telegraph office on Commercial Street East in Mount Gambier. And we can see here on this side is the Victorian Telegraph office. And over here is the South Australian office. And of course, Victorian, uh, the Telegraph was being developed up there in the Northern Hemisphere. The Indian Telegraph also from a capital city to a port the first one was in 1851, and the telegraph now is starting to extend itself uh, initially from England across to France, and then it was gradually moving through Europe. And interestingly, it tended to follow the path of those mail ships. But there were some security concerns. Um, Crimea, Afghanistan, very familiar names. But that did encourage the British authorities to replace that line with a telegraph, and this was its intended passage. Uh, an overland line through India, and then more sea cables. There was also plans to get a telegraph line around here and down the Malay Peninsula. And in 1858, a couple of interests were starting to talk about a telegraph connection directly from uh, Gaul. Uh, to Western Australia. Charles Todd favoured that because that was a way of getting Western Australia connected to the eastern states. And there was another interest when the line from Singapore down to Batavia was uh, constructed. And there were interests there who would go from Banjulwangi, little town on the end of Java, just across the strait from Bali to Moreton Bay. And again, the Queenslanders were quite excited about this because that would make them the first point of contact. Uh, there were issues about the cost and cost sharing. Uh, there were some technical problems because the cables, the undersea cables, started to develop faults. Charles Todd wasn't too fussed. He thought that was just a technical glitch. They would sort that out. But a lot of those projects unfortunately faded away until we get to about the 1870s. And a company, the British Australian Telegraph Company, or BAT, is formed. And their proposal is rather similar to the previous one, connecting to Queensland. But they're going to go a more direct route. Instead of having all of that submarine cable, they're starting to realise that overland cables would be technically preferable. And uh, this was their idea. But of course, having to cross the Northern Territory, which is then under the administration of South Australia, they needed to talk to the South Australian government. Uh, this is the state of play when this was happening, uh, what I call the communication crescent. Uh, we've got Adelaide connected through to all of the other capitals. We're now getting a direct line from Adelaide to Sydney, so there, and there are other uh, multiple lines going across to Melbourne, and our telegraph has been extended up to Port Augusta. The plan of the Queensland government was that as this line came in from uh, Java and uh, came to somewhere in the vicinity of Normanton in the Gulf of Carpentaria, they have been pushing their telegraph to the north. And what they're proposing to do is to take their overland telegraph across to meet the incoming line at Normanton. But uh, the promoters needed the permission of the South Australian government, and of course, helped by the Roaring Forties, uh, Commander Noel Osmond arrives here in Adelaide first. And the South Australian government says, well, yes, we'll agree to you crossing Northern Territory, but how about we do something a bit different? How about we build an overland connection provided you bring your telegraph ashore at Port Darwin? And uh, being fairly sensible business people, BAT accepted that offer, much to the understandable chagrin of uh, Queensland. Then the game was on. No sooner had Parliament made that decision, then Todd was told to make immediate arrangements for carrying out the work. This was about the 10th of June, 1870. Six days later, the bill that actually authorised the project uh, received assent. 
but by this stage, Todd is up and running, uh, carrying out this extraordinary project. All he's got to do really is connect the dots of Port Augusta to Port Darwin, and that's the story that Derek will be taking up and telling us about. It got underway to an excellent start. Here they are planting the first pole at Darwin. The date is the 15th of September, 1870, just three months after that enabling bill was assented to in the government. But now the race was well and truly on. Thank you indeed, Richard, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Bunton. Thanks for joining us today and for your uh, wonderful introduction to the conference. <laughs> we got any time up our sleeve? Uh, did that bell go? I heard, I heard the faintest of tinkles. Uh, if we start to run over time, there will be more and more insistent tinkle. <laughs> so we've got a, got a few seconds to uh, raise anything with Richard. Is there something that you'd like to do? We may or may not get this with every speaker. Here's an opportunity to ask something of Richard in that warm-up period and that fascinating uh, uh, moment, that sliding doors moment, where, where we managed to persuade the bat that it's going to come from Adelaide rather than from Brisbane. Yes? Who financed the Telegraph? A state loan for something like £200,000. In today's money? The, oh, through the, uh, <laughs> 40, uh, for, Derek, you know that offhand, 40 million or something? The Brains Trust is coming up with a number for us. Yes, right. That, what, 40, 50 million? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mega bucks. Mind you, that was the quote. Ah. <laughs> And the final price? Uh, about four times over budget. <laughs> and eight months late, but that wasn't entirely their fault. <clears throat> yes. The yes. No, the South Australian government. And that was what made it so attractive to the company. They didn't have to worry about constructing that land line. They just had to stop at Port Darwin. It, it's fair to say. Uh, no, because the, uh, and Derek will be uh, telling you more about this, but basically the Overland Telegraph was built out of fencing wire. Number eight gauge galvanised iron wire. There you go. Copper, uh, there was a copper line that was run uh, quite some time later. Yes, up the back. Yeah, I read down something that the Telegraph Uh, there were the line basically was over land, but they had to have a submarine section that went across the Port River, and that little section was that went across to the Lafeva Peninsula. That was the section that had actually failed, but the line itself was still serviceable for uh, for quite a few years. Yeah, there was a private line. Uh, people were impatient to have this telegraph connection. In fact, called James McGeorge said, well, OK, I'll build one. And his line was operational, I think, almost the day that the Todds got off the boat at Port Adelaide. But then one of Todd's first jobs was to buy the line. I think he paid £60 for it and then dismantle the telegraph line. So it's a bit ironic. Yes. I'm not sure the last time, it's where the town hall is now. And walking, I think on the, um, on the post office side of the town hall, there's a plaque that mentions the intercolonial uh, connection just by the gardens. Mm. It's an example of uh, telling the story, isn't it? Uh... Mm, yes. Okay, I think One more for Richard or are we done? Thank, thank you. you. Richard Venus, thank you very much for your contribution.